Good morning, church. <laughs> just want to go through a few verses with you this morning to continue our study of stability in the Proverbs. And we are going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 14 this morning. Just a few verses. So if you want to turn to me to Proverbs 14, I'm going to read this to you from the Passion Translation. And then we'll go back through and talk about it more specifically. So uh, starting here in verse 1, it says, Every wise woman encourages and builds up her family, but a foolish woman over time will tear it down by her own actions. Lovers of truth follow the right path because of their wonderment and worship of God. But the devious display their disdain for him. The words of a proud fool will all come back to haunt him, but the words of the wise will become a shield of protection around them. The only clean stable is an empty stable. So if you want the work of an ox and to enjoy an abundant harvest, you'll have a mess or two to clean up. <laughs> so going back up here to verse 1, you know, there's some great li little nuggets of wisdom in these verses. It says it's showing and contrasting, comparing um, the wise versus the foolish. So in this first one, it says that the fruit of the wise woman has a family, a home, a household that is built up and encouraged, whereas the fruit of a foolish woman, her family is deteriorating, decaying, falling apart. Um, and that is a process that happens over time in both instances, but you're either working one way or you're working the other. And so, you know, especially for moms, we need to, uh, you know, look at how our family is responding to what we're sowing into them. Are we sowing in words that encourage, words of truth, words of wisdom that builds our family up, strengthen them from the inside out? Are we allowing our families to decay and deteriorate and go downward? Um, it's a great responsibility we have as women of the household, but it is also uh, it comes with great reward. So wise women, make sure you are building up and encouraging your family. Then here in verse 2, you know, we look at this comparison, the fruit of those who love truth. Uh, they walk uprightly, they're on the right path. They have an awe, a respect, a fear of the Lord. This is what characterizes them. Whereas the fruit of the devious, devious means one who turns aside or departs from the truth. They actually are displaying disdain, contempt, and despite uh, despising the Lord. So, you know, as we examine the characteristics of these fruit in our lives, we need to, uh, you know, just check ourselves, check our families, check, check the people that we love around us and make sure that we are on that right path where we're walking uprightly in the wisdom of God, that we are not turning away or departing from his truth because we do not want to be a people who are showing any contempt for our God. Uh, verse 3 is comparing the fruit of the foolish man's lip to the fruit of the wise man. This is about our words. Um, the fruit of a foolish man's lips, they come back to haunt him. They cause trouble in their life. They, uh, the literal translation means a rod for his back. It ends up being a punishment upon this person, bringing pain and backlash into their life. Whereas the fruit of a wise man's lips produces protection. It's actually a shield. You know, if we, if we look at the uh, verses in Ephesians 6 that says, talks about the shield of faith, the armor of God, when our words are full of faith, when we're coming into agreement with God, with his word, with his ways, it is an actual shield around us. It protects us. So our words are so important to keep an eye on. And then here in verse 4, this is what I really wanted to, to focus on today because it's something that God's really been showing me things about lately. Um, it talks about two different kinds of stables, <laughs> uh, two different kinds of places where you keep an animal. Um, one of them is easy, clean, requires little work and no risk, no responsibility, 
but it produces nothing. Whereas if you're gonna keep animals that are gonna do the work, that are gonna labor and um, help you produce something, there's a way that's more difficult, yet there's strength given. It's messier, yet there's a grace to clean it up. It's riskier, yet there's security. It takes more responsibility, yet there's wisdom to handle that responsibility. And it produces an abundant harvest. You know, it, it just made me think, in a, uh, think about when I was growing up, my mom's kitchen was always bustling. She was completely um, dedicated as a mother to you know giving us really nurturing meals she cooked everything from scratch and it was you know just made such a mess and I really didn't have an appreciation for it till I got a lot older um, in fact you know when Ryan and I were first married <laughs> I thought I'm gonna have a clean kitchen all the time I'm not messing with all this stuff and we ate a bunch of prepackaged food that was awful and unhealthy <laughs> And, uh, you know, I just thought, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to waste time on that. But the thing was is that my mom wasn't wasting time. She was sowing into us. She was nurturing our bodies. And, you know, God has gotten me straight on that. <laughs> uh, it's the same spiritually in our homes and ministry. God calls us to do great exploits in his kingdom. So we have the choice. We have the choice to take a step back, to play it safe, to stay out of the mess and the hard work and the responsibility, yet nothing's going to be added to his kingdom that way. You know, we also can choose the path that he set out before us to do these great exploits. Yes, it's going to be challenging. It's going to take effort. It's going to require us to take responsibility and to clean up messes. But wow, how fulfilling and worthwhile it is. You know, anything that is going to be fulfilling in this life, anything that's going to produce something that's going to have fruit, it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some time. It's going to make messes that are need to be cleaned up. And I just love the, the illustration, the picture that that verse paints to encourage us, like, no matter how things are, how hard things are um, in the kingdom business, it is worthwhile what we do is worthwhile eternally, not just on this earth, but eternally. We are dealing with people's eternities. And if we are willing to do these great exploits for God, <laughs> there's gonna be a great harvest. So I just encourage you, ask him, how do I participate, Lord? How do I get in on this great harvest? I wanna be a part of this. I wanna do this for you. And he's gonna give you a path. He's gonna give you a way that is gonna be full of his provision and that's the wonderful thing no matter how hard it is he's already laid out the provision there for you there's a grace for it for it upon you so I just encourage you to dig your heels in and go for it man I'll never get any claps like that <laughs> amen amen praise the Lord Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hmm. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful day to be with you guys. I tell you what, you know, we haven't been talking a whole lot about offerings, you know, because, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't been led by the Lord, led by the Spirit in a manner to to begin to speak about these things, but as I was just kind of praying and asking the Lord about those, uh, about these things, you know, uh, you know, I just wanted to once again just come by and tell you thank you, you know, thank you for all the, all the people that have been dedicated, that have been sewing in to what's going on here at Island Church to keep the, keep things moving in the in the fashion that we're we're doing things right now, being, you know, uh, honoring God with their finances. I, I'll let you know. 
Uh, we just put in an offer on a building up in Derry City. So praise the Lord for that. We got things moving in the right direction. Maybe the guards won't shut us down up north, amen. But it's, uh, uh, we have uh, some good things on the horizon. We have a good things that are happening. Why? Because it doesn't really matter what's going on in the world right now. I'm telling you, God hasn't stopped. Amen. God is desiring to move. God is desiring for, for us to get pressed into the kingdom. Because I'm telling you, when, when things do open up, and they will open up, you know, don't get, don't, uh, get disdained on those things. They are going to open up. And when they do, church, we need to be in that place. We need to be in that situation that we are so filled up with him being in Christ. Don't, hmm, yeah. don't let this time go to waste. Amen. Don't let this time go to waste when you can't be doing all the things that you know, because the things are going to get real busy, you know, here in the months to come. Don't allow these times to come to go to waste, because I'm telling you, just like when Kimberly's saying, we need to make the decision, because when this thing opens up and we're able to actually go talk to people, lay hands on, on people on the street, you know, have services, do, do all kinds of things that the Lord's asking us to do. We need to be ready and not just filled up to the top. We need to be overflowing in him to where we just erupt where everywhere we step, that the signs and wonders and miracles begin to follow us, that we don't talk about anything but the kingdom of God whenever we get into people's presences. Amen? Amen? I mean, this is, could this be a, a spot that, what is the good that came out of this? What is, what is, what has the Lord used this situation for good? Amen? What is that? I'm telling you, he has used it, if, if you've been listening, if you've had your ears open to what the Spirit of the Lord is having to say, he's been drawing people into the secret place. Amen. He ought, he's been drawing people in the depths of the things of God that maybe some people never even stepped into before. That maybe they never even desired to step into them before. Amen. But this, this is the time. Don't let it pass from you. Amen. Glory to God for it. Glory to God for it. I'm telling you, it seems like as we've been studying these things in the kingdom, you know, studying things about the kingdom, studying with the, the seven letters of the church about, you know, the actual letters that Jesus himself has been writing to us, the body of Christ, not, not just the churches 2,000 years ago, but that he was addressing to us right now. And the more I continue to study in the word and listen to what he's saying to me, it, I'm telling you, it seems like, <laughs> I'm, t I'm telling you, the church is in absolute rebellion. Hmm? I tell you, what a way to start off a message. Amen. I tell you, the church is in absolute rebellion. Amen. Now, now listen, don't, don't, don't allow yourself to, 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 or permit yourself to yield into what the modern day church says is rebellion. Because that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about a rebellion against being in him in everything that we do. Amen. A rebellion against him and everything we do. What, what, is, what is rebellion? You know, what, 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 is that, what does that word even mean? I wrote down this, I wrote down this definition here. It's, it's a violent action against those in authority, against rules, against, against, uh, against, against the rules or against normal or accepted ways of behaving. And continued on, it says rebellion is a, is a feeling of a strong disagreement with an organization or with its people, with the organization, or with its people. So what, do, so what do people do when they're in rebellion against the government? I mean, people know about that, you know, all too well over here in this part of the world, but what do they do when they're in rebellion against the government, when they, when they don't agree with the ideology that a government is pushing upon them, when, you know, whether it, whether it stem from oppression, you know, suppression, or bondage, what do they do? They completely separate themselves from that ideology, amen? They completely, they, they draw a line in the sand, and they step on the other side, and they separate themselves from it, amen, and it, which is rebellion against it. Rebellion against what's trying to put them in bondage, and they rebel against those things. But the key is, the key is these things are, are derived, rebellious, rebelliousness. It's derived from philosophies. It's, it's derived from our ideas. It can be even derived from some of our own want-tos, amen? But in regards to the church, what, what is rebellion in the church? See, the modern church wants to tell you, you know, you know, the rebellion, we're being in rebellion against the church or against the body of Christ or against the kingdom that God has set forth on this earth to be the, the governing entity. What, what is rebellion when it comes to regards to the church and in regards to us as regards to believers? What is rebellion? 
Amen? Not many people would say rebellion is just, you know, deciding not to get, not to get planted in a church and, or just not come to church, only come to church here and there. That, 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 they'd consider that rebellion. Some people would consider, consider it not fulfilling your call and your destinies upon your life. Some people consider the financial selfish people that are selfish financially, they would, they would consider that rebellion. Some people consider rebellion that the people that have a love affair with drink. Some people consider rebellion a love affair when people have a love affair with pornography. Amen. But I'm here to tell you today, that is not rebellion against the kingdom. That is the product of your rebellion against the kingdom. That's the product of it. That's the result of it. But it's not the root. It's not the root to these things. Your root is found in your rebellion against him against the king of king, against his, against his desire for a union, his desire for intimacy. And I'm telling you, that lack of intimacy, that lack of, that lack of being pressed in produces these other things in your life. But that's not your rebellion. See, don't just, don't just try to deal with these things. You know what you need to deal with? These things your vertical relationship. We need to deal with the intimacy factor. We need to deal with who he is in our life or who we are in him and all things, amen? Now, I mentioned some of these things, and, pe- and I can hear people saying, oh, whew, praise the Lord, Pastor. I, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't fall in any of those categories, man. I'm great. I'm not in rebellion. Well, let me act like Jesus here for a minute, and let me just step it up just a little bit, amen, for all those that, that don't fit in those categories. You know, are you, are you walking in divine health? Are you prospering in everything that you put your hands to? Are you casting out sickness and diseases? Are you laying hands on the sick and watching people recover? Are you casting out devils, casting out addictions in people? Are you doing those things? Because if, if not, I'm telling you, that is, that is not why you're in rebellion. You're, that is the fruit. The reason why you're not doing these things is because it is the root of the problem. Our intimacy. Our intimacy, our, our intimacy, our walk with him. And because everything we do is balled up into him. Everything, and everything proceeds out of that. We got to get out of this place, church, where we're, where we're only locking up a portion of him. Like, I'll serve him on Sundays. I'll serve him on a Wednesday. I'll serve him this part of the day to where everything we're involved with is encircled and, and encompassed with him about him, about desiring him, about allowing him to to change things in our life, amen? Let let going of ourselves, Hmm. letting go of ourselves and being absolutely consumed with him. I'm telling you, church, that's my desire. That, that, That is my only desire, is to be completely consumed with him. And I'm telling you, just when I think, man, I've I've got there, I'm I've stepped into a depth that I don't think I could ever, 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 ever attain to. I'm telling you, my eyes get open, my spiritual eyes get open and say, man, there's so much more. There's so much more to be consumed and then get consumed and get consumed with him and everything that we do. Amen. I think as I say these things, many people say, man, that ain't, that, these, these things aren't fair. Not fair for you to say these things, man. I'm I'm a reborn Christian. I'm pressed in. I got I've you know I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I've I have laid hands on people and people have, have got healed and and many things. I've experienced many of these things in my life, amen. But the point I'm trying to make is it's not in our actions. Amen. That that is not our measuring stick. Our measuring stick is not the things that we do. Our measuring stick is him. And we don't have to worry about the things we do when we get so pressed into him, amen, because these things come from him, amen. It comes from a being consumed with him, amen. I mean, it seems like, I mean, I can hear, I can hear this in my, in, my, in my spirit. It's like anytime we talk about, you know, being pressed in or, not, or doing things right or not doing things right, it seems like people are, are always, you know, contemplating the hell or the heaven thing. Are you, are you, are you keep on saying, I'm not going to hell? Am I going to lose my salvation? And am I doing, am, am I doing these things or am I permitting these things to come to my life? And I'd say, this is, this is allowing the minors to become the majors in your life. How I many y'all know hell, it's, that's, that's a minor in the Christian walk. 
It is not, it's not something we need to be dwelling on. It's not something we need to be in fear of. It is an absolute minor in the things of God. It's, it's a minor. We need to be majoring on the majors. What is that? Being full of the Holy Ghost, being consumed with him, allowing the things that he desires us to do to be proceeding out of us, not, not worrying about if we're making it to hell or if we're making it to heaven. Church, that ought to be settled if we are Christians. These things ought to be settled. What does is, what is Colossians 1.13 say? That, that he hath delivered us out of the power of darkness. Amen. Jesus has delivered us out of the power of darkness and he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son and who we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I'm telling you, was hell a big deal? It was for about half a second in my life before I got translated out of that kingdom of darkness where which I was headed. But see, that, that quarter of a second, that mil, millionth of a second, and when, when I got translated into the kingdom of his dear son, I mean, it was a big deal then. I don't think about it anymore. It's not a problem. It's not something that we need to be dwelling on. It's something we need to be, we need to be pushing aside, amen? We need to be pushing these things aside. We need to get to that place where we are absolutely consumed in Christ, being a part of him, being in him, in everything that we do, in everything that we do. Hmm. That's the only thing that will change the philosophies in our life. That's the only thing that will change our ideas. He is the only thing that can change any of these things in our lives. Hmm. Let's see where we want to go here with this, but I'm, I just have this, I just have this sense, and I just want to talk a little bit about in him. That's kind of what I was, I was planning on going with. But I don't believe, church, we can come to this place of understanding anything regarding the kingdom of God and how he desires to operate in us until we, we understand the in him part of being in Christ. The, the in him, that, that it is about him. Amen. That, that it isn't about that isn't about us. It's about him and everything we do full stop. Amen. It's not about trusting in your own ideas. It's not trusting in your own gifts and your own talents. It's not about trusting in, in and even trying to mold people to look like you and to act like you. It's not, that's not about him. It's, it's about him. It's not about you. It's about him. Amen. I tell you, I've had many people say, man, pastor, man, I'd, man I'd, I'd love to have your life, man. You had a, a great, successful business, man. You have, you have a, a, a wonderful family. You have, you, know, you, you, you have a great church. There's amazing things, man. I'd, I would love to be like you. And I say, man, you, you would not want to ever be anything like me. I am not a benchmark for anything. I'm not a benchmark you can even sit down. It's still way underneath the ground, amen. I am not a benchmark. Humans, we, man, woman, we are not benchmarks. There's one benchmark and one benchmark alone, and it's him. It's Jesus. That is our measuring stick for all things. You want to be like someone? Be like Jesus, amen. Now, you want to find him? You want to get intimate with him? You want some knowledge and wisdom of him? Like, like come get hooked up with me because that's, that's where I'm running with full steam ahead, guys. That's where I'm running. That's where I'm pressing into. That, that's my desire. That's where I'm going. If you want that, come along with me. But listen, don't be like me. Don't be like me. Because I promise you, you'll miss it. Amen. But I'll show you the way. We'll find it together. Amen. We'll, we'll, bump, we'll bump our knees, but we'll go forth. It's running as fast as we can, church, to get, to get pressed in. Because this is what it's about. It's being in him. It's being in him. Not modeling ourselves after other people. Amen. Let's back up. Let's go ahead and back up here. Let's, I'm going to go to back there to Colossians. I want to read some of these verses here. Because these are absolutely powerful. In chapter 1. Go, yeah, let's go back up to, to, to verse 9 here. Let's just teach here for a little bit. Amen. I love this, I love this prayer on the, uh, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit you know, uses through, through the Apostle Paul here to the church of Colossae. It's, it's in a powerful prayer. I listen to church. I, I probably pray this for myself almost every single day. Amen. I change out the use and I, and I change it to, to me. Amen. And I, and, I, and I pray this over myself all the time. In verse 9 it says, For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. For this cause, what is the cause? If you go back up to verse 8, it's, it's who hath declared unto us your love in the Spirit. He says, 
It says, for this cause, because the, the agape love of God has been so dwelling on the inside of you that it's being released into you, released into your families, released into your children, released throughout the, the, the church that's around you to where you're even getting a reputation for it. For this cause right here, for the love of God dwelling in you and through you, for that cause, we, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Isn't that a, isn't that a novel idea? Hmm? Isn't that a novel idea that we actually pray for people? Amen, that we don't walk around and, and talk bad about people, gossip and, and create strife with people, but we actually pray for people. Amen. You know, even the, yes, absolutely. We pray for the babies. We, we pray for the adolescents. We, we pray for even the ones that are in maturity that may even have made a, a misstep or not. But, but what a novel idea that we actually pray for the sons and daughters of God. I'm telling you, that is amazing. Now listen, when I'm talking about praying, I'm not talking about getting into the prayer meeting, amen, and, and wanting to, to, to lift up someone's name and the things that they're doing and say, oh, everybody, let's pray for that person now because all these things are going wrong in their life so we can use it as a form of gospel, uh, gossip. I'm talking about praying for people, having a, a sincere heart of the love of God in you being released through you, desiring that great things happen for them. Desiring that they, that they fulfill the callings and the destinies that God has on each and every one of them, amen. Praying for people, I'm telling you, that's, that's amazing. He says, I pray for you to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. That we might have the knowledge of his will, not our will. Not necessarily your pastor's will. Not necessarily your parents' or your wife's will. But that we get a knowledge of, of his will. Where are we going to find that out, church? You're going to find that out getting in complete intimacy with this word of God right here. Like my pastor would always say, you can, you know, you can, you'll, you'll, ne- you'll be as intimate with the Lord as you are with this word right here. You say, well, I don't really like reading. Well, you're going to have a hard time getting in, in intimacy with him. Amen. These are words that he's spoken to us. These are words that he's put in to to guard us and protect us, to put boundaries for us, to to reveal who he is to us so that we we won't be led by some some other spirit. Amen. So it's something that we can have a boundary in. A knowledge of his will. What is knowledge? Knowledge is the understanding of how things work, the protocols and the boundaries that go along with it. It is the knowledge how things work and the protocols and boundaries that go with it. He says, I would, I desire that you have a knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What is wisdom? It is the understanding how to correctly implement that knowledge that you have. To correctly implement the knowledge that you had. How do we do that? By spiritual understanding, by that intimacy with the Spirit of God that's on the inside of us, that allowing to the Word and the Spirit to come together and change our lives where we can be led by the Spirit in everything we do, not just in a couple things, but that we are so hand-in-hand hand with union with the Spirit of God that we are led by Him in everything that we do. You say, why does that matter? Because see, we can have a, we can have a verse. You can, you can grab a hold of a verse out of the word and you can try to implement it into your life or, or try to see the fruit or the results of that verse in your life. But listen, if it's not applied correctly with the wisdom of spiritual understanding, you're never going to have the harvest of it. You're never going to have the heart because it's not, it's not your will and how you want to force a round peg into a square hole. Amen. It's, it's having the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, there's some of those boundaries we talked about. What was that last week, I guess, or the week before? The boundaries in our faith, right? There, there are boundaries. It doesn't matter how much you, you stand in faith. It doesn't matter how much you confess. Listen, there's boundaries that you can't cross, that, that they make what you're believing God for null and void. What is that? When, word is, when God has spoken something into existence... You can't go outside of it. Why? Because it's spoken in existence. It's, it's implemented. It's been carved in the stone, if you will. You can't go outside his word. His word, you, it doesn't matter how much you want to go against what his word says. It doesn't matter. It can't happen. It can't happen. You can't, you can't come across someone's will. You can't change their will by believing God or standing in faith. For you can't do those things. Why God doesn't do it, you can't do it. Amen. And then doubt. Doubt and unbelief. What does it do? It puts a fence around you to where you can't receive the things that God has for you. 
And you can't change those things no matter how much you stand in faith, no matter how much you're confessing, no matter how much you're believing God for, these things can't change in your life, amen? They will not change in your life unless you get these things, you know, moving in the right direction. Why? Because your faith does not usurp the word of God. Hmm? It, it, can't, it can't usurp the word of God. It has to be correctly applied to get the things that God has for us. Let me... Hmm. I'll give you an example while we're, while we're on this rabbit trail here. Salvation. You know, something that we're all believing God. Is there, anyone, is there anyone online, is there anyone in this room that you're believing God for someone to get saved, someone to get reborn in your family? Well, how do we go about doing that? Do we go begging God, God, please, I know, I know you desire people to get healed. Will you please get them saved? Will you please save them? Will you please save them? Will you please save them? You know what that's going to produce in your life? Absolutely nothing. And although it won't produce anything in your life, it's not going to produce anything in their life either. Nothing. Why? Because that's not the protocol of how God works. He doesn't go against their will. Right? So what do we do? We follow the protocols that the Lord has given us. We can come against the adversary on that, can't we? We can command Satan to get his hands off of them, to take his scales off of their eyes where they can receive the word of God and get planted. We can ask the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers across their path to, to sow the word of God, to water the word of God, to sow the word of God and water the word of God. Why? To give them every opportunity to receive what the Lord has for them. But see, that's using the correct protocol. And I'm telling you, if you'll saw, start following biblical absolutes, biblical, you know, uh, biblical avenues of, of, of what God is asking us to do anything, you'll start getting people saved. Amen? But this begging God to do something he's already done is not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything. Not because I say it, because the Word says it. Because the Word says it. In verse 10 here, in verse 10 here it says, that you might walk worthy unto the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, that we might walk worthy under, under the Lord, that we might live in a manner worthy of the Lord. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that something? That we might live worthy, that our lives might be worthy of him. Hmm? That we might walk worthy, that our desires can be put on the, on, the, on the wayside and we can begin to take up his desires and we can receive the things that he has for us. We'll know where to go plant and go do the things that he has us to do. I'm telling you that we might live a life worthy unto him. 2 Peter 3, 9, what, what does that say? We've used this for, for several different uh, services here. Not will, God is not willing that anyone should perish, but what? That all should come to repentance. And what is that? that? That all will come to repentance. All will change their thoughts and then change their thoughts and beliefs of who, who actually God is and who Jesus is. And we'll begin to yield unto him instead of yielding unto our own desires, yielding unto the things that we have, that we want, 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 but we'll begin to yield unto his desires. Say, what is that desire? That he wants you. I tell you, if we can get back to the simplicity of things, his desire is that he wants you. He desires you. He wants you. He wants you to come into this place of complete union with him. This, this, these are the desires of our God. We need to change the way we think. We need to have this metanoia, you know, come into our lives, amen, and, believe, and begin to change the way we think and the way he thinks in each and every one of our lives. Why? So we can be partakers of the divine nature. See, some of this stuff, people will think it's heresy. It's all in the word that we can be a, a partaker of his divine nature. Is there anyone in here that is a partaker of the divine nature of God? I'm telling you, that's what I'm, I'm going after. That's what I'm desiring to be, to partake of his nature, release myself of mine, and be able to do everything like Jesus said, everything that he has done, and even greater things. Being partakers of his nature. Hmm? Being fruitful and every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being fruitful, that everything we put our hands to, that it does prosper. I dare say, if you're putting your hand to something and it's not prospering for the kingdom, why are you doing it? Why are we doing anything that's not prospering something for the kingdom? You say, well, pastor, I got to work. Your work can become your ministry. 
You say, well, pastor, I got hobbies. Hobbies can become your ministry. My pastor, he loves to hunt deer, which people love that over here in Ireland, right? He loves to hunt deer. He loves to hunt ducks. And I'm telling you, that has become his ministry. He gets as many people probably saved out in the field doing those things than he does in the church. Why? Because it is his life. He is a partaker of that divine nature. He is fruitful in every good work. Everything that he puts his hand to, he desires it to prosper for the kingdom. So you desire to be in a running club. You desire to be in a cycling club. You desire to, listen, allow, allow your hand, allow the Lord to put his hands to those things through you that it can prosper for the kingdom. Everything we do ought to be with one, one goal in mind, church. Leading people into him. Introducing people into him. Helping people get more intimate with him. Helping people find their callings and their destinies for him. Everything we do ought to be producing fruit for him and for the kingdom. Amen. Why? Because we're, church, we're on a short, this is a short life we live here on earth. Amen. We have one job, and that is to release the kingdom. Amen. To gather people, to take them out of the pit of hell. We have been entrusted with that one message. Amen. In that short time, that 70, 80, 90, 100 years we're going to live here on this earth. It's nothing compared to eternity. But we got to get ourselves focused on the, on the right things. Let the majors be the majors and the minors be the minors. Amen. In verse 11, it says, Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, and all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. Now, now listen, this is, I don't know what translation you have in front of you, but this gets a little twisted in the King James here. So let me, let me, let me talk to you about it for a minute. It says, Strengthened with all all might. That word strengthen, it's derived from the Greek word dunamis, right? It's, a, it's that supernatural power. He's saying, so to be strengthened with a supernatural power with all might. Now that Greek word is dunamis, amen? It's talking about this supernatural explosive power of the Holy Ghost. You know, you know something amazing about that is where we get the word dynamite, amen? Dunamis is where we get the English word dynamite, which is what? Which is something amazing when you, you can put it into a rock and it'll explode it. And that's how they, they went for mining where granite is and all kinds of different things because it will explode and it explodes everything else around it. But there's one key element that comes with dynamite. Amen. What is that? It needs a flame. It needs a flame. It needs an igniter. It needs to be ignited. And this is what he's talking about here, that, that supernatural explosive power we have. We have to get it from him, from the igniting, from the igniting source. You say, what's that? That is the Holy Ghost. That is the Holy Ghost that not only dwells on the inside of you, that came upon you in Acts chapter 2 when it came in as a, as a pillar of fire and broke up and came and engulfed each and every one of them that were believing to where the power of the Holy Ghost came through them. It was the igniting force to, to, to where what? To where they walked out the streets. People were getting healed by their shadows. They were walking down the streets, lifting up, lifting up uh, people that were lame at the gate, beautiful, casting out devils, raising people from the dead, having this explosive dunamis power on the inside of them, ignited by the Holy Ghost. Not by religion. Ignited by the Holy Ghost. The same Holy Ghost that exists here today. The same, the same Holy Ghost that, that flows through our services. The same Holy Ghost that we're called to be led by and directed by. It's that same Holy Ghost that ignites that power on the inside of us. If we'll permit ourselves to be engulfed by him. Amen? He says that you strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now it says, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. This Greek word power here is not what we would think dunamis. Amen. It's the Greek word kratos. 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 Amen. Which is an amazing word. Listen, the best definition I could find here was from Rick Renner. And it says, it describes a demonstrative power. In other words, Kratos power is not a power that merely adheres to and believes in intellectually. See, this is, see, this is the, the problem with most of us Christians here. You know, we have dunamis power on the inside of us, but we don't have the igniter. And we don't have the igniter. It makes it an, an, an intelligible power. It's not something that we ever get to see demonstrated because we don't have that igniter on the inside of us. Amen. We don't have the igniter coming upon us. It's not one that merely adheres and believes in intellectually. Rather, this Kratos power is a power that is demonstrative, it's eruptive, and it's tangible. Woo! I'm telling you, that's the kind of power I want. It's demonstrative. 
It is eruptive and it's tangible. It almost always comes with some type of external outward manifestation that one can actually see with his or her eyes. This means Kratos power is not a hypothetical power. It is real power. It's not a hypothetical power. It is a real power. It's not a mythological power. It's not a power like that that you think of when you learned of Zeus and some of these other other false gods. I mean, it's not a a hypothetical fake power that that you've never seen anything produced from it. No, no, we get in Christ and we have the fullness, the engulfing of this dunamis power. Kratos power is, is produced from that to where it's things that we've already seen. Church, we've already seen it, you, or, you've already, or you can read about it in the Word. It's things that's already been demonstrated. That power is where we derive ours. Not anything more than it, not anything less than it. So what does that mean? Can you heal the sick? Absolutely, Jesus did. Can you cast out demons? Absolutely, Jesus did. Well, what about if someone has cancer? Absolutely, Jesus did. What about if someone has cut off legs and cut off arms? Absolutely, Jesus did. Hmm? Because it was the demonstrative power, this Kratos power that he demonstrated for each and every one of us in that. In that being built up from that demonstrative power that he demonstrated for us. This is where you can have patience, that cheerful endurance with consistency. Long-suffering, the, the being long-tempered in everything we do. With joyfulness having the joy of the Holy Ghost come upon you because why we don't have to fear if something's going to happen when we go out and do it. It's already been demonstrated for each and every one of us. This is how we can know that his power is real. Amen. I'm telling you, that's some, that's some powerful stuff. I love that word. I love that word, Kratos. You know, a lot of the church, we believe, we're believe we believing for miracles. We're believing for amazing things to happen. And people say, man, I've never seen, I've never seen a miracle. I've never seen something happen. I've never seen, you know, this or that happen. And you may not have seen something specific in a leg growing or cancers or tumors falling off people. But I'm telling you, church, you have witnessed, if you are a born-again Christian, you have witnessed the greatest miracle that can ever take place. The, the greatest miracle that can ever take place, being taken out of darkness and brought into light to be released from an evil nature that's on the inside of you and be filled with a nature full of light and and godliness, amen? Taken out of unrighteousness and brought into perfect union with the living God is the greatest miracle. Like I've I've told you, I I think I've told you guys several times about this. This time me and a a friend of mine, Mark Murphy, were praying over a guy that was popping in. He was was addicted to tablets and he was coming in and out of of our meetings. He didn't want to sit in the meeting and learn anything. He just wanted to get prayed for. So we'd pray for him a couple times. And and finally we we got him pointed to the place that this is the only thing that's going to fix you is if you you receive Jesus. He's like, all right, I, I need it. I need something fixed in my life. And when we laid hands on him and prayed on that, for that man, he had a, a lazy eye, one that looked directly sideways and one looked straight forward. And I'm telling you, when we, when we laid hands on him, his, his countenance changed from his feet up. You could just see it just going like a wave all the way up to him where, where he got light and color and a beautiful countenance to him. And that one eye just went whoop and, and came straight up and started looking at us. And it was amazing. Why? Because he got translated out of, the, out of the curse, translated out of darkness and light filled up and purged out everything that was dark on the inside. I'm telling you, the greatest miracle. It's the greatest miracle we can ever experience. And if we can experience that miracle, why do, we, why do we doubt the Kratos power of God where healing the sick is around us? Why do we doubt when, when devils come upon us? Why do we doubt these things and not begin to operate in them, amen? Well, I gotta tell you, because we're in rebellion. We're in rebellion, amen? We're, we're in, we are in rebellion against the word of God, believing everything that he's told us. I'm telling you, I've seen some amazing miracles. Amazing miracles. Amazing healings. You say, why is that? Because I believe it. Because I believe for it. I believe it. You know, I want to see it. I don't try to explain it away. <laughs> Amen? I believe God for these things that happen. And, and they happen. Not just through me. I'm talking about through other people, all kinds of different uh, ministries and people. It, it, they, they happen. Why? Because you desire to see it. It's real easy to, to intellectually talk yourself out of these things if you allow them to, amen? But we need to get in line with his word and the way he dies, desires to do things. Hmm. 
It says, giving thanks unto the Father who have made us meet or made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. I like this out of the Amplified here. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us and made us fit to share the portion, which is the inheritance in the saints, God's holy people and the light. I'm telling you, we have an inheritance from the creator of the heavens and the earth. I mean, thank God, I, I, you know, I desire to give an inheritance to my children. I, I desire to give an inheritance into this land through buildings and churches and different things that God's placed on us. But I'm telling you, we get, I have an amazing inheritance from God himself. An amazing inheritance. You say, what is that? It's eternal life. Not heaven or hell, it's eternal life with him in union with him. I'm telling you, it's being able to walk in divine health. It's being able to prosper. It's able to have joy and compassion and the goodness of God flowing in everything we do. It's, it's enabled to have a union with him. I'm telling you, that word union is powerful. To be in complete union with him, being in Christ. It says, who had delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I love that. I love that word hath, meaning it's a perfect present tense, meaning it's something that happened 2,000 years ago. Remember when Jesus died, got up on that cross, and then became resurrected and sat at the right hand of the Father. 2,000 years ago, we hath delivered us. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness. 2,000 years ago, up to the point where we're at right today and the point where we'll step into them tomorrow, and the day we'll step into the day after that. I'm telling you, that, that is, has been done then and continues on to the day we're living out. He's hath translated us out of the power of darkness. That power is the Greek word exousia, out of the authority of darkness. Hmm? What does that mean? I mean, Satan does have no authority over you. He has no authority in your actions. He has no authority over you. You have the authority over him. You have the authority over the things he tries to bring in your life. He doesn't command you. You command him. We need to get on the right side of the, of, of the ball here and begin to start commanding him instead of allowing him to tell us everything that's going to be going wrong in our life. Everything that you feel, everything, that, everything your emotions have, allowing him to, to infiltrate our minds and our bodies. We need to start commanding him. We need to start believing him. Believe in him to command him, amen, and allowing these things to happen in our lives. Hallelujah. He had delivered us out of the authority of darkness, and he hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Hmm. You know, the Lord is amazing what he did on the cross. For us, you know, we sang about it a lot today, probably longer than was even expected. But uh, we, uh, we, we sang about these things for a long time because I'm telling the cross is amazing. But see, I think a lot of us, we have a problem. We stop at the cross. Amen. We need to, we need to begin to be the resurrected people. I mean, thank God for the cross. Thank God for, but see, if he wasn't resurrected, none of that stuff would have mattered. It's him being resurrected from death, sitting at the right hand of the Father. That, that's the place where we're at. We, you can see yourself in Jesus on the cross, but we are now seated in heavenly places with him, walking in full power and authority that he has placed upon each and every one of us, amen? He hath delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What is a sin? Huh? It's defined as a forfeiture of a loss and a share because you didn't hit the target or you missed the mark. It's a forfeiture. Amen. What would we forfeit? We forfeited him. Amen. A separation. That's what death is, is a separation from him. It's a forfeiture, you know, because we missed the mark, because we yielded unto, unto darkness instead of light. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Interesting thing about that word sin there is it's a, it's a noun. It's not a verb. It's not a verb. It's not talking about the things you're doing. It's talking about a nature that's on the inside of you. When God redeemed us, he redeemed us from the nature, the dark nature that was on the inside of us. And he, as we were translated into the kingdom of his dear son, we were redeemed. Our nature was redeemed. 
Hallelujah. Let me just, I'm going to read through these last ones because I think I'm kind of getting into a rambling stage here. It says in verse 15, who, hath, who, hath, who is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be on the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, all things were created by him and for him, that, in, that he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, talking about Jesus, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, and in all things that he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that he in him, in Christ, should fulfill or have the fullness dwell, or all the fullness dwell. And in verse 20 here, it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to earth or the things in heaven. Listen to this in the Amplified. It says, And God hath purposed that, that through, by his service and his intervention of him, the Son, all things should be completely reconciled back into himself, whether on earth or in heaven, as through him or in him, the Father had made peace by means of the blood of the cross. See, if you can get this, if you can get that verse, if you can, if you can begin to understand these verses that we, just, that we just said here, it will change your life forever, knowing that the Father was in Christ himself doing what? Reconciling us back into himself. Not because he hated you so much. No, because he loved you so much. He stepped down in Christ and reconciled himself. This is what 2 Corinthians 5, 5, 19 says. As God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. They have committed unto, unto him the word of reconciliation. And then he made us ministers of this reconciliation. So why did Jesus come? So we can be reconciled unto the Father that we can come in complete union in Christ, in him. We can be completely reconciled into a God that loves you. I'm telling you, Jesus is perfect theology. I love that quote from Bill Johnson. Jesus is perfect theology. You want to know who the Father is? Look at Jesus. You want to know what the Father looks at? Look at Jesus. You want to know how the Father acts? Look at Jesus. Don't go to Job. Don't go to these different books and try to figure out what other men think God is and how he acts. No, no. look at Jesus who is God, the fullness of God. Because God was in him reconciling each and every one of us back into himself. This is, this is our God. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we serve. I guess so what am I trying to say today here? Church, if we'll just change the way we think, it'll change us forever. That word metanoia has been all over me for about two months now. One of my favorite Greek words, if we can just change the way we think about our Father and what he thinks about us, it will change everything about us. If we can just come to this place where we're in him, in Christ, it will change everything everything about us. Change everything about us. Get to this place we know that we've been delivered out of darkness. We've already been translated. It's not something you've got to work for. You've already been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We just got to find our identity in these things. Find our identity in these things. Stop being religious. Stop allowing the world to, to tell us how to think and how to view things and allow Jesus to to mold us, to change our way of thinking, amen. Get intimate with them, church. We need to get intimate with the word. We need to be desiring to know, have more knowledge of the word. I'm telling you, it seems like most people, most people think this is just for the preacher. You know, the preacher needs to know these things, but, but I don't need to know that out there. You know, I'll let, I'll let him tell us, well, how in the world are you ever gonna know what is being taught to you is real or not unless you know the word? You know, Paul said, the, or the word said that the Bereans were more noble because why? Because they went and they checked the scriptures. They studied out the things of God. They didn't take religion's view on it. They wouldn't figure these things out for themselves, amen? Because we have been translated. We have been rebirthed, amen? And let me say this for, for some of these newer, newer viewers, newer listeners that, uh, that view into our podcast and view into our, our, uh, our online service here. Listen, 
When I, when I say the, the word reborn or rebirth, I, I mean, I've never, I've never ever thought about not saying that word until I moved over here into Ireland because you get such a pushback over here and from anywhere else in the world. This, this place here, I'm telling you, as soon as you say reborn, it's like a, a wall goes up and people don't want to listen to you anymore. Well, listen, we need to get ourselves out of those political, out of those, out of those religious way of thinking, amen? Because listen, I'll tell you, church, I didn't coin the word reborn, Amen? I didn't coin, it's found in John chapter 3. Jesus coined that term, the, to be reborn. He's the one that said we need to be reborn. It's not, it's not a Catholic thing. It's not a Protestant thing. It is a Jesus thing, amen? It's a word of God thing, amen? I didn't, current, I didn't coin the word Christian, amen? That was coined by the Syrians in Antioch when they saw, in Acts chapter 11, they saw the people living and living for God, amen? They said, man, those people look like Jesus. They smell like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. They're healing people like Jesus. They're casting out devils like Jesus. They're worshiping together like Jesus. They're breaking bread together like Jesus. They're doing everything like Jesus. They're Christians. They're ones that are Christ-like. They're Christ-like. They're one like the ones they're following. Amen. Good Lord, could we, could we own up to that name? To where we look like Jesus, act like Jesus, begin to talk like Jesus, begin to heal like Jesus, begin to cast out devils like Jesus, begin to give up our lives for others like Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I'd love to go there. Maybe I'll do that next week. Well, maybe we'll do that next week, talk a little bit about being in him by the rebirth in John chapter 3. Maybe we'll go that direction because I obviously don't have the time to do it today. So, so let me just end with that there, and we'll, we'll pick up maybe if the Holy Ghost permits us to in John chapter 3 for next week. So, so Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to, to come together in your midst, Lord, come together, worship you, Lord, learn, teach, you know, do, do the things that you've called us to do, Lord. We praise you for it, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. We, we thank you for this, for, this, for this union that you've afforded each and every one of us, Lord. May, may the people that are listening to this and watching this, Lord, may we, get, may we come to the realization of what this union actually is, Lord, what, what it actually means to be in Christ, Lord. May we forever walk out of religion. May we forever walk out of, out of a performance-based Christianity, Lord, and desire to be pressed in into you, learn about you, talk about you, allow you to change everything that is about us, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for that opportunity. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for giving yourself up, Lord, so we can have this opportunity to be in you for eternity. We glorify you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We hold your word. We put a demand on your word. We, we thank you for Psalms 91, that there shall no evil befall us. Neither shall any plague come nigh our dwelling place, Lord, for you give your angels charge of us, Lord, to, to keep us in their ways. We, so we don't even dash our foot against the stone because we are people that are desiring to be in the secret place under the shadow of the Almighty, Lord. We desire to be pressed in to you in everything that we do. We thank you, Lord, that a thousand may fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it shall not come nigh us because we are yours. We're your chosen. You are. I am my beloved. Thank you, Lord. And you are mine. We thank you for it, Lord. We glorify you for it. We thank you for the righteous labor of our hands, Lord, each and every job you've given us to. May we be a blessing to those places, Lord. May our work jobs, may our places of, of work, may they be our ministry in the days to come. May we not allow that to become a waste to us. Lord, we thank you for our church. We thank you for this local body. We thank you for the local body that's watching, the ones that are tuned in, the ones that are here now. Lord, we thank you for this local body, Lord, that you are, that you are beginning to use us. You're pulling us into this place of intimacy, Lord, where we can absolutely change the environment you've placed us in here, Lord. We thank you for the ambassadors of Christ you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord, here at the Island Church. We are covered by your blood. We are empowered by your word, and we are anointed by the Holy Ghost. Amen.